coming up on Bible Time with Dr. Tony Crisp. And the servant is no greater than our Lord. If he had tribulation, you and I will have tribulation. The church of Jesus is going to go through tribulation, but not the great tribulation. This is Bible Time. Welcome to Bible Time. Take your Bibles and open to the book of Daniel, chapter 12. The book of Daniel. Now, I started last week a two-part series, which is now turning into a three-part series on Babylon rising. And what we're going to do is do a biblical search to identify Babylon. And in doing that, we have to go back to the prophecies of Daniel, and we have to go back to the promises that are in the book of Revelation along with the prophecies that go with that and see if we cannot determine how we determine who these major players in the Scriptures really are. And so what I want to do is help you tonight to orient you and contextualize the Bible and how we make decisions about prophetic passages. Because if we don't do that, we're just going to be guessing more or less. And guessing and estimation is okay if we're talking about the stock market. But it's not with the Word of God. Because these are eternal truths. And when you turn back to the book of Daniel we're going to tie a couple of uh, things together. First, I want to describe to you what Daniel had seen in chapter 2 and chapter 7, and keep your place in chapter 12 because that's where we're going to be reading in just a moment. But you might want to write in the reference of your Bible, Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7. Now the reason is, is because in those two chapters, you have in chapter 2 the great Colossus, the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon that he saw, the head of gold, the chest and arms of silver, the belly of brass, the, the legs and the thighs of iron, and then the toes that were mixed with iron and ceramic clay, which, as you know, do not go together and will not hold together. There is a reason for that imagery. But it is clear in chapter 2 that man, represented by Nebuchadnezzar, who was the greatest king of that era, and Daniel said that he was, and so therefore I can say that he was, was that head of gold. But that is how man looks at himself, how man views the world. As a gray colossus, man is the center of everything. Men are giants. We are rulers of our own destiny. That is a lie from the pit of hell. Man is not the center of the universe. God is the center of the universe. And so when Nebuchadnezzar sees this great colossus of a man, Daniel, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says to him, you are seeing everything that is going to happen from now, which was in the 500s, that's right, because Nebuchadnezzar took Daniel captive in 605 B.C., and it wasn't long after that till he saw these visions and uh, they dreamed these dreams. And so he saw this great Colossus. And Daniel said, You, O king, have been shown by the God of heaven, the Ancient of Days, all of the kingdoms between now and the end of time as we know it. Now, isn't that amazing? And there are only four kingdoms. Only four. And... Uh, all of the time since then and all of the time that will be are summed up in four kingdoms. You had the head of gold, which was the 
Babylonians themselves under King Nebuchadnezzar. And that didn't last very long. It was a very short-lived kingdom from about 512 when they gained dominance over Syria and they destroyed Nineveh in uh, 612. And uh, three years later, they destroyed the Egyptians at the Battle of Carchemish in northern Syria. And then they made their way down into Egypt and uh, took on their way back up Daniel, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, and took all of the blue bloods and all of the elites to Babylon, to Mesopotamia, to the land between the rivers, ancient uh, Babylon. Now, remember, there was another Babylonian kingdom, Babel, which goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 10 and Genesis chapter 11. And that was uh, old Babylon. That was the first Babylon. Babel, in the ancient language, even before uh, Hebrew and Aramaic, Babel, or Balim, was the word for gate. And Babel originally was the gateway to heaven. That's what they thought. And remember, they were going to build a tower that would go to God himself. And so that philosophy uh, stuck there. Why? Because it's demonic. And according to the book of Revelation, whoever and wherever Babylon is, uh, it is the source of evil and of demonic activity in the earth. And so Babylon is important as to where it is and uh, who is behind it. And so you have Babylon. That was the first empire Daniel pointed out. Then you have the Medo-Persian empire, which was two empires joined together with the Persians and especially King Cyrus uh, that uh, was the head and the king of that federation. And they are represented as the silver chest with the two arms, and that's Medio and Persia, Media and Persia. And so uh, the Persians ruled from 539 all the way down to 330. And then you have Alexander the Great. That was the belly of brass. And... Uh, uh, when we will look in a moment in chapter 7, you will see that uh, he is looked upon in a, as an animal, as a leopard, and, and he has four heads. And the reason is, is because after Alexander's death, uh, there was not one person that rose to conquer as he did, but he had four generals that divided up the kingdom and ruled the kingdom. And then you had Rome. And so Rome came to power. The Republic really uh, came to power uh, from the 60s before uh, Jesus was born. From 63 onward, Pompey walked into what is called the Promised Land today, uh, the land of Israel. And uh, they ruled with an iron fist. I mean, literally, historians say they were a kingdom of iron. And as you know, in 325, the kingdom split. Rome split in two. You had the western half that was in Rome, and then you had the eastern half, the eastern part of the kingdom, which had its capital in Byzantium, which was called, uh, after that split, Constantinople was its capital. And it was on the Bosporus River uh, in what is modern-day Turkey. Now, the reason I'm telling you that is because Rome split into two legs. And the Bible says that Daniel saw these ten toes, which later are identified as ten kings or ten nations. And uh, they were the nations uh, that would make up what is modern-day Western Europe. And uh, they would be what would be called the revived Roman Empire. And all of that is beginning to take place today. And we are going to see, you can mark it down, we are going to see ten nations that are going to become very prominent, but three will pull together and um, will bow down to one. That will leave a great seven. I'm not saying it's the G7, but it's going to be something like it. It's going to be an economic powerhouse from which the Antichrist 
that uh, man of sin, the lawless one, the son of perdition, will rise out of that European Union. And when we get into the book of Revelation, we will look at that in great detail. But what I want to do now is talk about Babylon. Because in chapter 2 of Daniel, you have the uh, image of all of these kingdoms portrayed as a great colossus. Why? Because that came from Nebuchadnezzar, who is a mere man. Daniel had a vision himself in chapter 7, and he viewed the world empires not as a great colossus and giant, but as wild beasts that are so wild they were inexplicable in human sentence and syllable. It was so far out. Uh, a leopard with four heads, a bear that had ribs coming out of its side. It had all of these different kind of animals that were recognizable and yet were not recognizable. And so all of that Daniel saw, and it was so traumatic to Daniel. All you have to do is read, and when you read Daniel, you'll see that it made him sick. He had to be out of commission for a while because he was so traumatized by that. Well, the same thing happened in chapter 12. And what you have in chapter 12 is a vision that Daniel saw that was sealed in chapter 12 and has still not been opened until this day. And inside of that sealed book, is the identity of the center of gravity that will be the headquarters of the Antichrist within that seal scroll that Daniel sealed in chapter 12. Let's look at it. Daniel said, and at that time Michael shall stand up. Michael is the archangelos. R.K. is the word, the Greek word for head or first or leader. And uh, then you have angelos that we just transliterate into English, messenger. You see, a, an angelos can be an earthly messenger like in uh, the book of Revelation chapter 2 and 3 where he's talking about the messengers of God who are the pastors. Those are men. And then you have the angelos, which are divine beings. And 90 plus percent of the time when angelos is used, it is used for a divine messenger. But there are not, as I believe many of my colleagues teach, many archangels. I believe there is one archangelos, and his name is Michael. And he is the primary messenger of God and the primary protector of the people of God called the nation of Israel. When you, when you look at the Bible and when Michael shows up, he is always dealing with Israel. Now look what he said. That time Michael shall stand up the great prince who stands over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of, pro of trouble such as Never was since there was a nation. Now he's talking about the great tribulation. Now let me stop and parenthetically say this because this is assumed as well. Often I will have someone come to me and say, you are, you are not doing right because you're teaching people that the church of Jesus is not going, go, not going to go through tribulation. I have never said that. What I've said is they will not go through the great tribulation. The Megale Thlipsis that Jesus talked about. At Jesus himself said as long as you're in the world you will go through crushing. The word is tribulation. In this life we're going to have trouble. And this is why you need to watch who you're listening to when someone tells you that all of life is meant to be blessing and all of life is to be uh, good health and all of life is to be uh, fair winds behind us and uh, a rose garden of smelly roses and that we are just always spirit-filled and that means everything is good. That is deceptible. That is deceiving. And that is not the picture of the Bible. The Lord Jesus was absolutely perfect, and he lived through tribulation in his life. Amen. He was hated. 
He was lied about. He was mocked. He was scoffed and ultimately was crucified. And the servant is no greater than our Lord. If he had tribulation, you and I will have tribulation. The church of Jesus is going to go through tribulation, but not the great tribulation. The great tribulation is a time of unprecedented, unparalleled destruction that will come upon the earth to try men's souls like has never been before. This is what Daniel's talking about. And he said, such as never was since their uh, nation, even to that time. What time? The time when this is going to happen. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, every one who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. That's called resurrection. Some uh, to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. You see, folks, if heaven is real, hell's real. Now, we hear a lot about neither today. But everybody's not going to be saved. Everybody's not going to heaven. As a matter of fact, most of the people in the city where you live, and for those of you who are listening, most of the people in the city where you live will never be in heaven. Because the Bible says, straight is the gate, narrow is the way, and few there be that find, few there be that find it. Some to everlasting life, some to everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there stood two others, one on the river bank and the other on the river bank. And one said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, How long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? In other words, when's the end coming? Then I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river when he held up his right hand and his left hand toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever, that is God himself, that it shall be for a time, a time is one year, times, that's more than one, two years, and a half. So one time, two times, that's three and a half, that's three and a half years. And the power of the holy people, uh, when it has been completed, completely shattered, and all these things shall come to pass. Although I heard, I did not understand. Then I said, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And listen to what he said. Now Daniel said, after he had seen all of these things, he didn't understand it. That should give you comfort. You say, I read this, I read this, and I don't understand it. In time, you will. And so the Bible says that he says, go your way, Daniel. In other words, do what I've told you to do, for the words are closed up. When? They are sealed till the time of the end. Now, what we're going to see in just a moment is when that time shall be. Many shall be purified and made white and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. In other words, wicked people are going to continue to be wicked until Jesus the Messiah comes. But those of us who are wise, who are children of light, we see what is coming about. That's what he's saying. And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. And we'll explain that later. But you go your way till the end, for you shall rest. That's talking about dying. And you will arise. That's talking about resurrection to your inheritance at the end of days. So Daniel's portion that dealt with all of these end time events was sealed up. Now what was a seal? A seal was a scroll and then wax was poured over that scroll 
And then a signet ring was just like I have on my hand with letters on it. A seal was put in that, and that was to seal that. And if you opened it before time, it was punishable by death. You remember Uriah the Hittite? The father or the husband of Bathsheba. Do you remember Uriah the Hittite, the husband of Bathsheba? The scripture says he carried his own death warrant back with him to the battlefield. Why? Because he had a scroll in his hand and it was sealed by King David. And he knew that it would, it would be a curse for him to open that. And he was a more righteous man than any of the others and he did not open it. Now, very quickly... Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. What I'm telling you is there is a reason that I am doing this because I want you to understand that not only is interpreting prophecy important, but there is time elements that are associated with some prophecies. And when Daniel was told, seal up that book, no one knew what that is and will not until the time of the end. And there are some things that when it's opened will not be understood until they happen. And then everyone will say, that's what that meant. But look what Revelation chapter 5 says. John said, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Daniel's scroll has been found. Now you say, how do you know that? Because of what was inside the scroll. Because these things are the things that will happen in the end of days. What did Daniel say was in that scroll? What would happen in the end of days? But look what he says. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and loose the seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scrolls or to look on it. They couldn't even look on it. Michael couldn't open it. Gabriel couldn't open it. No one could open it. And look what John said. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open the scroll and to read the scroll or to even look at it. This was Daniel's scroll. And it had been closed already. Now this day it's been closed 25 hundred years and this is still in the future and no one has been worthy to open that because the time is not right but there is coming a day when the one who is worthy will be made plain to all the earth and to all of heaven and John said I wept much but one of the elders that he had talked about in chapter 4 said, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. And look, he will open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. John, expecting to turn around and see a ferocious lion in all of its splendor, with its great paws about to rip open that scroll. But when he turned around, the Bible says, I looked and behold, in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb. A lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the spirit of the living God. It's the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then he came. That is this, this, this person who is a lion and a lamb. He came and he took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken that scroll, 
that had been written, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp with golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints, and they sang a new song. For you are worthy, you're worthy to take the scroll. Lord, no one has been able to open this. Is this the time? Is this what Daniel was sick over for weeks after he saw the devastation to this planet that you made beautiful? When, you, when, when all of these things that are going to be unfolded, the plagues, the pestilence, the earthquakes, the fire, the sickness, the boils, the, the, the demonic activity. Lord, is this what it's all about? Here is what they sang. You. You are worthy to take the scroll, to open its seals. For you were the one who died. You were slain. And you've bought us. You've ransomed us. You've redeemed us to God by your blood. From every tribe and every tongue and people and nation. And have made us kings and priests, not paupers, not slaves, but kings and priests to our God. And we shall reign on the earth. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Amen. Judah. And he has prevailed. When these scrolls are opened, we're going to see beginning in chapter 6 in a couple of weeks, we're going to see years, months of devastation like the world could not even imagine. What is the remedy? The remedy is repent and be saved. The remedy is turn from your wickedness. The remedy is flee unto the Lord. The remedy is, as Moses put that serpent up on a pole, he wrapped it around a pole, put a crossbar there, and that serpent was there brazen, looking down on the ones that were being bitten. And God made it so easy for the people that Moses said, for those of you who have been bitten by the serpent, look and live. Look and live. That's God's word to you. Look and live. Thank you for watching Bible Time with Dr. Tony Crisp. We hope that the Spirit of God has touched you through Tony's message and that your knowledge of the Bible continues to grow. As you study the truth of the Bible and you feel you do not fully understand what it means to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, we would like to help you. Contact us today at Tony Crisp. Org, and we will send you this free booklet, How to Know God in a Personal Way. This resource will help answer your questions about how you can begin your journey as a follower of Jesus. Bible Time with Dr. Tony Crisp is made possible because of your prayers and generous financial support. If you feel God is leading you to contribute to this ministry, you can easily give online at TonyCrisp.org slash donate. Or you can send your gift to P.O. Box 6596, Knoxville, Tennessee, 37914. A gift in any amount is appreciated. No gift is too small, and there's no gift too large that can be used to God's highest purpose. Thank you.